recording. Okay, everyone, thanks for coming to this uh, uh, virtual seminar. And uh, today we are very fortunate to have Professor Eugene Chang giving this uh, virtual seminar. So Eugene, uh, well, he, he graduated from uh, Caltech in the year of 2000 and uh, uh, was a Hubble Fellow at uh, IAS for just one year before joining the faculty of UC Berkeley. And uh, uh, since, uh, since 2001, and he has been there since then, and uh, he served as the chair of the astronomy department from 2015 to 2018. And uh, Eugene works uh, uh, on theoretical astrophysics uh, with the focus on planet formation and the protoplanetary disk. His work has been awarded uh, many awards, including the Hubble Fellowship, the Sloan Fellowship, and uh, recently he was uh, uh, selected into the, uh, as a fellow into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. So today uh, he'll talk about the uh, well, the end game of planet formation, that was the title he gave me. So with that, please go ahead. Oh, okay, right. thank if you. Sorry, uh, if you have questions, please, uh, you can just go ahead and un unmute yourself or and speak up or just uh, leave a note in the chat and uh, I'll be monitoring that. Sorry, go ahead. No, not at all. Uh, thanks very much, Wei, for your kind introduction. Uh, and thanks for setting this up. Uh, uh, you know, I know I, I, I'm totally missing out, of course, on a real time visit to, to Toronto and I, and I always enjoy my visits. Um, nevertheless, I thought it uh, appropriate to give a seminar, um, not least because it keeps me off the street, uh, but also because uh, much of the work that I want to share with you today is directly inspired by work that was done at Toronto. And so I thought it was appropriate that I pay my respects today. Um, I have uh, two papers to share with you. Uh, one is just recently accepted. It's a study on the resonance dynamics of extrasolar sub-Neptunes. This is work led by a graduate student at Berkeley, uh, Nick Choksi. He's in his first year and uh, is an NSF fellow. And the second piece of work is still in progress. We're still working on it. Um, it has to do with the metallicity trends exhibited by gas giants. And this is work that's led by Sivan Ginsberg. He's a 51 peg fellow at Berkeley. So by way of introduction, I can get my screen working. Uh, here's a plot that tries to summarize everything or almost everything under the extrasolar sun. So plotting planet mass versus separation and on the high mass end, we have the gas giants, both near and far. On the low mass end, lower mass end, we have the super Earths, which are discovered in abundance by Kepler. Uh, I try not to be misled by the density of points. This, you know, all these data were just lifted off of the internet uh, from surveys of various kinds, each with their own individual biases. Uh, so I try to pay closer attention to the numbers that I've annotated here. Uh, these are the average occurrence rates, the average, uh, the number of planets averaged uh, over all sun-like stars of planets of various kinds. So um, we know now that Jupiters are more rare compared to super-Earths, which are really comparatively everywhere. Uh, it's also emerged that when you do find a Jupiter around a star, it tends to be found between 1 and 10 AU. That's a picture that's emerging from decades of radio velocity work, which have been moving their way out. At the same time, the direct imaging surveys are moving their way in, and they seem to be converging on what looks to be a kind of sweet spot for giant planets uh, at a few AU. I'll talk about these but, uh, at the end, but, but I want to start by talking about these, which are the more typical kind of planet that you find. Um, Super Earths, also called sub-Neptunes, anything less than four Earth radii, masses between five and 20 Earth masses, mostly solids, a little bit of gas, maybe a few percent by weight in gas. And uh, they're really everywhere. So where you find one sub-Neptune, 
uh, you very likely find at least two others. The average number of uh, sub-Neptunes per planetary system is three. And this is a nice number computed by Wei Zhu and uh, collaborators. So here's how these uh, sub-Neptunes distribute themselves in period space, a really period ratio. So plotting the, outer, the uh, orbital period of the outer member of an adjacent pair of uh, sub-Neptunes, the uh, P2 uh, normalized to P1, the orbital period of the inner pair. And they're really all over the place. There, there's a minimum value that's given by uh, dynamical stability, right? Because if you squeeze the two planets closer together, then they disrupt each other's orbits and they collide. Um, but otherwise, they take a range of values. So, so there's a broad continuum of values, really any value. However, on top of this broad continuum, there are these excesses, these peaks, right? The most obvious one is the three to two resonance, where you have an excess population of, of pairs that are near the three to two mean motion resonance. So three to two means uh, the inner one makes three, approximately three orbits for every two that the outer one makes. And this is, this is what I we, we would like to understand. We would like to understand uh, why there's this excess near the three to two, also appears to be near the two to one, maybe some others. Uh, but we would also at the same time like to understand, right, the, the continuum. So the relative magnitudes of the peak to continuum. Now, if you zoom in, uh, and I don't think you need to squint very hard, uh, you'll notice that the excesses are not quite at nominal resonance, right? It's not quite at three to two, but it's a little wide of that, right? It's not 1.5, it's 1.51. So the excess is really, uh, the pairs are separated wide of resonance. And in addition to that, you can see it more clearly for the two to one. In addition to the excess, there's also a corresponding deficit, right? So they're missing systems, uh, just short of resonance. So not at 2.0, but at 1.99. You can see it more clearly when you bin the data. Uh, here, we're, we're plotting things uh, versus delta. So delta is our measure of the fractional separation away from resonance, right? Away from this perfect integer ratio of either three to two or two to one. And when you bin the three to two and the two to one systems together, you find there's this characteristic peak at delta of about a percent, and there's a, there's a associated trough at delta of minus a percent. And of course, this, this problem was first recognized uh, uh, by Lithwick and Wu, who, who uh, recognized its importance and also developed a, a very nice solution that Nick and I have tried to build upon Okay, so I'll try to describe what we've done since their work. Um, maybe the first thing I'd like to say about these resonances is that, and I have to say, uh, uh, this is a feature which I didn't appreciate until I started looking at this, uh, but I really should have appreciated it right from the beginning because it's a very basic, very basic property of resonances. And, uh, yeah, I only appreciated it recently, but it really should be no surprise in some sense, right? That the excess is wide of resonance because resonances, they, they like to be wide, okay? They don't like to be at 1.50. They like to be at 1.51. They naturally split. They're naturally wedged apart, the pairs. And um, we have a series of cartoons which illustrate why. So the first cartoon uh, just demonstrates that when the orbital period ratio is exactly three to two, Okay, when the inner planet makes exactly three orbits for every two that the, that the outer member makes, then conjunctions, the conjunction always occurs at the same orbital phase of uh, the same orbital phase. Okay, and a conjunction occurs when the two planets are, uh, encounter one another. That's when the interaction between them is strongest. So uh, when, when it's exactly three to two, then the conjunction, if I arrange the conjunction to be at peri at time zero, it will always be at peri at all other times, right? Because it's of this perfect integer ratio. So I just go ahead and move it forward. And then you see the next conjunction happens at peri. And every time the conjunction happens, we leave a little X mark to mark where the, where the conjunction happens. And of course, it's always at peri. It's just like a dance, right? Where you, you take three steps forward, I take two steps back, and then I do a little twist, 
And so we come back to the same place. So the, the configuration is exactly repeatable. And the fact that the uh, conjunction happens at Perry is important because there's a symmetry around Perry, right? So maybe it's clear, closer if I do go back. Yeah, so there's a symmetry around Perry because all the interactions, all the momentum exchanges between the two planets just before Perry exactly cancel with the interactions just after Perry, right? There's a perfect symmetry around Perry. And so the, 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 the configuration is, is exactly re strictly repeatable. Okay, so that's, that's the situation. Uh, well, the situation is actually more complicated than this, right? Because of precession, right? The, the inner planet here is on an elliptical orbit, and so it precesses. And there's this dash mark, which we mark the position of Perry, and the, it's going to move, right? The pericenter moves. Uh, here, it's going to move backwards. And it's easy to see why it moves backwards, backwards relative to the mean motion, because the outer planet is tugging, tugging at conjunction. It pulls, right, outwards on the inner planet, gives it a positive radial velocity. And of course, if you have a positive radial velocity, then you have to be after Perry. Right? And so what you've done, when you pull outwards, then you shift, when you pull outwards near Perry, you shift the Perry backwards so that uh, you're after Perry now. So if you play this movie, you'll see that the Perry center moves uh, backwards. Oh, see, it's moving backwards. Okay. Now the consequence of this, right, is that the conjunction is no longer going to be at Perry anymore, right? Because the, the, the Perry center is moving towards the conjunction so you're rushing towards conjunction so you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna arrive too early right so here comes the next conjunction and you'll see that it's not going to be a peri even though we've arranged for the period ratio to be exactly three to two so here comes the next conjunction oh you missed right because of this regression and of course you're, you've ruined it now because 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 of this epsidal regression Okay, so now the conjunctures are going to capture all over the place. They'll be distributed randomly. Okay, so, uh, but you can, if you know that your watch is running too fast, you can try to adjust for it, right? So I used to have this problem. I, I used to, to try to avoid coming to meetings too late. I would set my watch so that it would run five minutes too fast. And that way I would drive to a meeting perfectly on time. Okay, and let me tell you how nice it is to have finished my term as chair. Oh my God, what a relief. I don't, and then I, right after I, be, I stopped being chair, I switched my time, so I returned to normal time, and then everything was good again. Anyway, if you know you're gonna arrive to the meeting, miss time, you set your watch, okay? So it runs too fast. So the inner planet, can, you can set the watch. You can set it by running too fast, so the inner planet, you can increase its mean motion by shrinking the orbit, right? So here, this orbit's smaller compared to that one. So you've naturally wedged the two planets apart from one another, right? So now the mean motion is increased. So now you, uh, so now you run this thing, and now, because your watch is running fast, deliberately, boom, the conjunction always happens, right, at Perry. So very, it's very natural. So when we talk about a three to two resonance, when everyone says, oh, it's a three to two resonance, what they're really talking about always is a three plus epsilon to two resonance, right? And that's generally true, at least at low eccentricity. This is generally true. Okay, and all of this is, is confirmed with the equations of motion. So for the people in the audience who I know already know this, um, right, the, the resonant angle is phi, the stable point is at phi of zero, it's a fixed point if phi dot is zero, right? Then if once phi dot is zero, then the difference in the mean motions is just given by the, by the precession. And that precession is, is, is backwards, it's negative, and, which is why delta is naturally positive. The planets are naturally wedged apart. One thing you'll notice here, right, is that this regression is faster if the eccentricity is smaller. Right, which makes sense. If, if uh, in the limit of, of zero eccentricity, that's like, that's like a, a really fast processing, you know, 
uh, orbit. So the smaller the eccentricity, the faster the epsidal regression, and the more the planets have to be wedged apart. And this is the underlying idea of Lithwick and Wu, that they want to damp the eccentricity, they want to drive the E lower to increase pull mega dot to wedge the planets further apart. Now they use tides, right, to do it. Tides raised on the planets by the star, the dissipation of that tide will damp the eccentricity. Yes, that, that it wedges the uh, planets apart, but there are other ways to damp the eccentricity too. And I think we need the other ways actually, because you see this, this split, this peak trough asymmetry at a variety of orbital periods, right? You see them at short orbital periods, but you also see them at long orbital periods, like out to 100 days. And it's hard, I think, to get tides to work at long orbital periods, right? So we're looking for, so tides great for short orbital periods, wonderful, but at long orbital periods, I think we need something else. And the something else I think is the disc. So we're gonna use the disc in addition to tides to, to damp the eccentricity. So this, is, this, was our, this was our little study. Okay, so we're gonna to try to reproduce this structure. Before you move on, I, I have a question. Yeah, yeah, sure. So what you showed us uh, applies to the case where both Ellipses are aligned, right? This, they have the same, the uh, same major axis pointing in the same way. But if they're anti-aligned, anti it seems to me like the, the both effects are going to cancel, right? Both are going to persist in the same way. So then, would, would, then you wouldn't, it seems to me like you wouldn't need this mechanism at all. They could be in, in perfect resonance. Oh, no. So, okay. So, so there are two resonances involved. And actually, the previous movie, I, I mean, this, for, for what I showed, I was actually doing the... Uh, uh, um, circular restricted uh, problem. So the outer one uh, is actually just a circle, okay? So there's this resonance where you can approximate the outer body as, as a circle, but then there's another resonance, right? There's another resonance where um, for every, for the three to two resonance actually splits into two sub resonances. And the movie that I'm showing is appropriate for one of those sub resonances where you approximate the outer one as a circle. There's the other sub resonance where you approximate the inner one as a circle and the outer one as an ellipse. And in that case, the, um, uh, for the conjunction, the conjunction happens, I think this is what you were saying, the conjunction happens at the, let me get this right, the apoapse, right? The apoapse of the outer body. Okay, so that's the fixed point for this other sub-resonance. And we, we account for both. We account for both. The equations of motion, we, 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 we have terms for both. So I don't know if this, this addresses your question, but well, we, account, we account for both. And the conjunction happens at the carry of one, of the inner one, and at the apo of the other one. So, so, so I see what you're saying, but um, in simulations that I ran, usually what happens is that the two planets develop opposite uh, uh, LRL vectors. So the ellipses are tend to be anti-aligned in, in n-body simulations. Um, well, at least if, if, you have, if you have similar masses, if you have larger masses, it might be different. But for si if, you, if you run simulations of similar mass, then they tend uh -huh, to be. Uh -huh. That it could, I mean, I've, I haven't explicitly, I'll tell you, I haven't not, we have not explicitly checked uh, Pomega 1 minus Pomega 2. I didn't, I actually don't know uh, what that looks like for us. We might also be anti-aligned. I'm not sure that any of thing that I'm about to say depends on it, whether it being aligned or anti-aligned. Um, I could check that though. Um, uh, we're, more, we're really interested in the, in the differences in the mean motions. Right. Uh, yeah. Okay, but I can, I, can, I, can, I can check and we can compare later. Okay. So Eugene, can I interrupt yeah. as well? Yeah, okay. Uh, so I'm wondering, you know, if you believe in planet migration, you could say that these, you might want to argue that these bumps arise because the planets are migrating in and they got trapped in this residence. That's, the, that's, that's, that's what I'm about to say. Okay, but you're saying they're migrating because of, of interactions with the disk. So that's yeah. different than what Yen Chin was saying because it was ties that pulled the thing. That's right, it's a little different. That's right. We, we're, so as I was about to say, 
once you invoke the disk, yes, you get eccentricity damping, but also you get migration. And it's going to be a one-two punch. We're going to account yeah, so, for So, so yeah. following along on that then. Sorry, the what? Torque, yeah. The torques in these resonances are pretty weak, right? And, and if you compare them to the torques in a disk in the minimum solar nebula, even I think, you'll, I suspect, you, you must have calculated this, that that torque would be way too big and you'd run over the resonance. Um, uh, I'm not sure about the running over part, but um, the, the torques, well, the upshot of all of my, all, the all of is, our work. If, if the migration time is shorter than migration time. Yeah, of course, of course, of course, of course, of course, of um, course. Short answer, to, short response to your, to your question is minimum mass nebula is nonsense. Uh, and forget about it because the whole point of our calculation is we're going to solve for the surface densities required to make all this work. Good, and, and uh, is it giving away everything if you say what it is compared to the minimum solar mass? Since you, since you ask, I, you know, I'll just give you the answer. It's uh, three to five orders of magnitude smaller. Exactly. Than right. MMS then. Yeah, okay. so this is happening way late. This is happening, this, all of this is happening very late. Well, you know, you could also do a planetesimal disk, of course. Uh, sure, why not? <laughs> well, because of course, you know, like with Jupiter, there's some indication that it migrated. And That's right, it, yeah. yeah, yeah, from the Hildas, yeah, from the Hildas. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, from the Hildas. Uh, anyway. We like the, I'll tell you, we like the gas because, you know, sub-Neptunes also have atmospheres, so we get uh, two for the price of one. But we also have asteroids, and I suspect all those other systems do too. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, go sure, ahead. Sure, but all of this is happening late. In a planetesimal scenario, it's also late. Absolutely. Yeah, it's all late. It's all late. So yeah. all of this discussion about pebble accretion and all that, I think it's irrelevant for, uh, at least for the last few doublings in mass. Sure. For these sub-Neptunes. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so for those of us who are not as fast as Norm, uh, I'll, 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 I'll try to bring us up to speed. Um, so yeah, we're, we're gonna talk about planet disk interactions. Uh, the disk properties of interest, right? At a disk radius A, there's this thickness. This is basically known, right? H is just given by uh, the, the uh, temperature of the disk, which is basically a few hundred degrees. And so we already know that H over A is on the order of a few percent. The main unknown is the surface density, right? What mass disk are we talking about? So that's the one parameter that we're going to vary to try to reproduce this, this structure. Okay, one parameter fit. Okay, um, the migration, right? Once you have a disk, it not only damps the eccentricity, but it also damps the semi-major axis. So there's orbital migration in addition to eccentricity damping. And both are just a consequence of dynamical friction, right? The same dynamical friction that, that causes uh, black holes and stellar clusters to migrate, spiral into the centers of galaxies. It's, it's also acting to cause planets to, to uh, migrate inwards as well. It's a little bit more subtle though, I, I would say, for a, for a disk because there are competing torques, right? If you have a planet uh, embedded in a disk, the, the outer disk exerts a dynamical friction torque which acts to migrate in. The inner disk does just the opposite, right? It speeds up the planet and so it acts to uh, push the planet outwards. And these two torques cancel to a large degree. Uh, Bill Ward recognized that actually the outer disk wins, not, not by much, by of order H over A. And it's because the Limblad resonances that are responsible for the torque, they're systematically closer uh, to the planet, systematically stronger on the outer disk than for the inner disk. So the 10 to 9 resonant, Limblad resonance is a little bit closer than the corresponding 9 to 10 resonance on the other side. Okay, so you can write down uh, 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 migration time scale A over A dot. It goes as 1 over M, of course, right? Because dynamical friction goes as M squared. It's a back reactive effect. And so the bigger you are, the faster you fall in. And of course, it depends on how much mass there is in the disk. 
the sigma. The smaller the disk mass, the longer is the migration. The consequence of this migration is that if you have two planets which are migrating, well, they're both migrating in, right? But you have a choice. You can either have them migrating divergently as they both go in, uh, okay? Or you can have them both migrate convergently, okay? And the convergent is more interesting because you can get resonance capture. So here's a little movie demonstrating this. You have two bodies, the outer one and the inner one. Uh, you're gonna have the outer one migrate convergently into the inner one. They're both not in resonance initially. Here's the location of the resonance and uh, you, we're, gonna, we're gonna watch to see what happens, okay? And by the way, this movie was generated uh, using Rebound, this wonderful code written by, by Hanno Ryan. So boom, you, you catch the test particle into resonance. Uh, when I look at this, it's like a fish, which gets like, I think of a fish, which is uh, caught by a net as you trawl the net right across the ocean floor and you catch the fish. And just like the, the fish gets more and more agitated as you bring it to a place where it does not like to go, the eccentricity of the particle gets you know, really high. And there are many ways of seeing why the eccentricity goes up. Uh, one way of seeing it is it's a consequence of adiabatic invariance, right? The same reason why you have a pendulum and if you, if you swing it and if you shorten the length of the pendulum, right? You draw the string up, okay? You shorten the length of it. Then the pendulum, the energy is not conserved. The momentum is not conserved, but the integral of PDQ is conserved, right? There's an adiabatic invariant associated with this uh, oscillatory bounded motion. And so you can, you can solve, right, for how the amplitude of the motion increases as, the, as you draw the, uh, draw the string on the, on the pendulum. Uh, same thing here as there's an adiabatic invariant associated with this bounded um, oscillatory motion within the resonance. And as you shorten A, as you decrease A, E has to go up to keep the invariant invariant. Okay, but now competing against this resonant amplification is the, is the circularization, right? The dynamical friction from the disk, same disk, which is also damping E. And, um, and here you're damping not the, not the azimuthal velocity, right? Not the orbital velocity, but you're damping the epicyclic velocity, right? Dynamical friction is trying to get rid of the epicyclic velocity. So you can write down the uh, eccentricity damping time. It looks very similar to the eccentricity, to the semi-major axis damping time, except you'll notice, right? For those paying attention, you'll see that it scales as h over a to the fourth, not h over a squared. So H over A is small, and so, and so eccentricity damping is very efficient. It's, it's much faster than semi-major axis damping. And uh, it's easy to see why, right? It's because there's no cancellation. There's no competition between inner and outer disk torques. The whole disk is acting to erase the epicyclic velocity. All of the, in fact, all of the co-orbital material is trying to get rid of the eccentricity, right? As first recognized, uh, by Pavel Artimovich, who you know, wrote down the torque for this first order eccentric uh, co-orbital, and that's the key, co-orbital uh, Lindblad resonance. It's all this co-orbital material, all this gas, which is co-orbiting with the planet, trying to kill off the eccentricity. Okay, when you fold in this, this uh, circularization, same movie, but now you, you, you fold in the eccentricity damping, this is what happens. You get caught, but your eccentricity doesn't skyrocket like it did before. You saturate, right? It's because the resonant amplification is balancing the eccentricity damping. And so you level out. You level out at a pretty small value, less than a percent or so. Um, so you reach an equilibrium in the eccentricity. And equilibrium eccentricity, it makes perfect sense, right? Uh, qualitatively, the shorter is TE, right? The more effective damping, eccentricity damping is, then the smaller is the eccentricity, equilibrium eccentricity. Likewise, uh, the faster is the migration, the smaller is TA, then the, then the larger is the equilibrium eccentricity. And associated with that equilibrium eccentricity, there's an equilibrium separation, right? Delta goes as one, delta goes as pomega dot, which goes as one over 
the eccentricity, right? The smaller the eccentricity, the faster the, the apsidal regression and the more the planets get wedged apart. So that's why this ratio flips for delta, for delta equilibrium. Okay. And, and you'll note, and the, the movie is really nice, right? Because you can see this delta X, you can see this dot, it's not on the dashed line, but it's a little wide, you know, of the dashed line. It's very naturally split uh, wider apart. At this point, it's appropriate to acknowledge that this equilibrium is not always stable, right? This was first recognized analytically by Goldreich and Schlichting, who pointed out that if the planet masses are too small, this equilibrium, the, the, the planets, if the planet masses are too small, they, they leave the resonance in the face of this damping. This dissipation breaks, breaks the resonance, but it only breaks the resonance if the planet masses are too small. Um, we have found, oh, we, we, we agree, uh, we verified it numerically, uh, but the planet masses for super Earths really are, are, there's no problem. They're plenty big enough to avoid this instability, okay? What, about, what are the masses that we're using? Five to 20 Earth masses. These come from radial velocities. These come from transit timing variations. Okay, so these, are, these are good masses. For, for Kepler super, super Earths. So for those masses, if you compare them to the critical mass to avoid the instability, there's no problem. You know, we're, we're clear of the mark. And this was not the conclusion of Goldreich and Schlichting. It's because they were using, we look back into it, it's because they were using masses that we think were systematic, what we know are systematically uh, too low. They used Kepler early data and they used a bulk density that was incorrect. So the instability that they found is, is it's, it exists, except it's just not relevant for Kepler super Earths whose masses are plenty big enough to avoid it. Okay, so that's, that's one, one feature of, of, our, of our solution. Okay, so that's, that's it. That's the ingredients of the story. And, and uh, what Nick has done is a simple population synthesis, a survey of parameter space, you look at different pairs of planets and different kinds of disks. Some, some migrate divergently, some convergently. And we're gonna look right at all the variety of possibilities that are, that, are, that are out there. We're going to see how the initial separation, some assumed initial separation between a pair of planets after millions of years of disk evolution, how it maps to some final separation, okay? So we like these plots because they tell you how delta initial maps to delta final. So um, every one of these points corresponds to a pair of planets, okay, in some, in some simulation. And here we're, we're not using rebound, we're, use, we're just integrating the uh, time averaged equations of motion, okay? So um, everybody starts on this line, right? That's the delta equals delta initial line. If you're a pair that's diverging, then you move up in delta space, right? That's the green points. You move up because delta is increasing. So you just move up in delta space. If you're converging, then you move down, right? That's all the blue points. They move down in delta space because you're converging. Okay. And these three panels correspond to three different disks, low mass, medium mass, high mass. And I'm going to zoom in. You can see, right, the, the higher mass disk clearly generates a lot more migration and uh, you really spread out from the delta equals delta initial line in both directions. Okay, for the low mass disk, hardly anything happens. So let's look at this panel up here, zoom in. There's really just two things that are happening. Um, well, maybe the three things. The first thing to notice is that the green points, the divergent systems, they, they're, they don't really do anything. They don't get caught into resonance. Divergent systems don't get caught. And the poor man's way of seeing that is to notice that um, at low eccentricity, it's impossible to, to, to keep the invariant invariant, right? If A goes down, sorry, if A, yeah, if A goes down, E also has to go down, but E can only hit zero. It can't go, go negative. In fact, to keep the invariant invariant, technically the eccentricity would have to go imaginary, and that's impossible. And so that's sort of a quick and dirty way of seeing that divergent systems cannot maintain the adiabatic invariant. They have to break out. So they break out and, and they, just, you know, they just move upwards and they don't really do anything. The convergent systems are the more interesting because they get caught. 
right? You see all these blue points? They're, they start at this line, and then they go down, and they want to go here, but they get caught like fish in a net. They got caught, and they get caught into the resonance. This gray band is the equilibrium delta that I talked about previously. So all of these points, as Norm already uh, figured out, are, all of these systems are the ones that are in the peak. That's the peak, right? So all of these systems that migrated into the peak. There's also a trough though. So here's the trough, right? Here's the gap, the, the, the deficit of systems. And all, that deficit is produced by the eccentricity damping. So this is the resonant repulsion with Wick Wu effect uh, kicking in here, which is emptying the trough. You could empty the trough, but it's not quite enough to produce the full magnitude of the spike. You still need these convergence systems, at least we find, to, to produce uh, the right uh, match to the observations. So let me show you the observations. The observations are this black histogram. Okay, the, the panels are, are, the black histogram is the same in all the, in all the panels, it's the observations. It's the observations from Kepler for the three to two resonance. Okay, so that's the black histogram. That's what we're trying to fit. Okay, this is versus delta. So here's the spike, right, the peak, and then here's the trough, okay. And the colored histograms are, you know, different mass disks. So really low mass, nothing happens. Really high mass, you overshoot. Okay, you, you catch too many fish, you've overfished the ocean, bad. Uh, so you overproduce the spike, okay. And it's the one that's right in between, which is just right. Here the surface density is 18 grams per, per square centimeter. This was, this was derived assuming an ex, a, a disk decay time of 10 to the five years. If you allow the disk to go away over 10 to the six years, then you know, this initial surface density uh, has to go down in proportion. So instead of 18, it's 1.8 grams per square centimeter. We can try to put this into context, right? Two to 20 grams per square centimeter. That's, that's our preferred value. This is very small compared to solar composition, uh, minimum mass reconstruction of a disk, right? These are naive, very, this is a very naive kind of reconstruction of a disk. You take a given planetary system so of super Earths, it's mostly solids, as I've said. You, then you add enough hydrogen and helium to the mix to bring the whole thing up to solar composition. And then you spread the mass around to create a disk. And this is your, your conception, a rather naive conception of what the primordial disk had to have looked like, right? A solar composition, minimum mass reconstruction. And that's huge. That's like, that's three to five orders of magnitude lower, higher than the fits that we get based on the Kepler data. Okay, so all of this resonance structure was not created early on. Forget about these gas rich disks. It, all of this was just the very last end game, the at last end chapter when all of the structure was, was created. Uh, this, you, yeah. Uh, Chris Thompson. Uh, Hi, Chris. Maybe this might be better reserved for the discussion, but I can refer you to some disk models that Russell and I published, I guess, five years ago, where we, the uh, basic idea was to get rid of the uh, Blanford Payne vertical magnetic field and imagine that it was a magnetic field from the protostar that was seeding angular momentum transport in the disk. And essentially, because of the inward diverging um, um, torques due to the flaring of the magnetic field. Uh, we got a, a secular decrease in the gas surface density. And the physical effect which we looked at, which would buffer that secular decrease, uh, was um, uh, ionization of the disk midplane by high energy radiation from the protostar, lofting, exciting turbulence, lofting uh, dust, and, and then suppressing ionization. And so in our models, we buffer between about uh, about five and, well, about 10 and uh, 30 grams per square centimeter. So. Oh, so, so you got yes. surface densities like this. Yeah. Uh, yes. that's, that's great. <laughs> it reminds me actually of, of, I don't know if you're familiar, um, 
uh, a disc model by Suzuki at all. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe, maybe well, the, you know, the principle was, it was, was, was related. Uh, our, our motivation was just that the distribution of the vertical flux across the disc is very hard to calculate, and no one has come close to an ab initio calculation of it. In fact, Bai, Zhuining Bai, I've heard him give a couple of talks at conference. Yeah, 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 yeah. That the vertical flux decays away. Um, and so for a certain parameterization of the flux to mass ratio, yes, Suzuki et al. were able to get a secular decrease in the, uh, in the, uh, in the disc. Yeah, okay. Uh, I, I, oh. I want to I keep going with this, but, but, but okay. this is great. Uh, thanks for letting me know. Maybe we can talk more about it in the, uh, in the Q&A oh, afterwards. Yeah. yeah, no, that's good. That's good. Uh, Sorry about it. That's great. No, no, no. It's, 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 it's nice. Um, yeah, I, you, can I, I ask a short question? Yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> so, so you assume this is sort of imprinted on the planet architecture in the last tens of five years on this tiny mini disk which just happened to be left over. Um, so the question is that you start this initial condition when you're integrating this evolution, assuming the planets are you know, flatly distributed in period ratio. Another way to say is that you assume the earlier, more massive, this left no imprint on the planet structure. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, the earlier back, that's, yes, is the short answer. We assumed that the period ratio, I mean, here was the period distribution. We assumed right. flat. Yeah. And so we don't so know. I, mean, I don't know what goes on back then. Okay. Although um, you say, you know, I mean, I, I do. It's, it's not completely ad, ad hoc because uh, this, this, um, this surface density that we find, this best fit surface density, uh, it fits in, right, with core accretion models because we need the surface density to be this low for these protocores to cross orbits and merge right so so it's not like oh they just suddenly the disk there's a reason why the disk has to be this low in mass by the time they've achieved their final masses of five to twenty earth masses yeah i think i'm natural, okay with natural, this natural, natural natural progression yeah Right. I'm okay with this passing through this uh, stage yeah. and probably yeah. even linger a little bit longer. But I'm just curious that the early stage could have had a very strong dynamical impact in this theory, if you just take the same framework. Yeah, that's true. I mean, type one migration is a serious problem the further back in time you go. So yes, uh, um, yeah, 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 yeah. The further back in time you go, the the, the less I can see, <laughs> you know, I, I'm just, I can see, I can see, I can see, I can put on my glasses, I can see down to the, like the last doubling or maybe the, the, the last the two doublings. Last scattering surface. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The last, right. the last doubling or the last two doubling. Right. But if you ask me like what happens three doublings ago or four, then I, I can't see. It's optically thick. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, um, Eugene, can yeah, yeah. I just quickly follow up on that too, since everybody's uh, interrupting you anyway? Um, so why, why why do you um, insist on on fitting the surface density, given that we know so little about how migration actually works? And you've presented you know, a very simplistic view of how migration works, but then there, there's this entire industry that claims to get all kinds of random migration rates for different disk structures, different thermal properties, uh, oh, cold yeah. torques, all these sort of things. Wouldn't it be easier to just fit for the migration time scale instead of the surface density? Um, well, I mean, I do, I, I do see what you're, this is Hano, right? This is Hano? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, okay, hi Hano. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, fair enough, I guess. Um, it's hard for me to see how these effects, I mean, the things you're referring to are things like, uh, you know, type three or, or, or uh, No, just, just normal sort of type one migration, you know, people claim that they get different factors by you know, several orders of magnitudes just by changing the thermal structure or the, the entropy gradient in the disk. So that feeds back into your surface density that you're constraining. But if you were just to constrain the dynamical quantity that's actually important for getting these systems in or out of yeah, resonance. Yeah, 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 yeah. Time yeah. Time, you could be more yeah. general. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, sure, we could reparameterize and express all of our answers in terms of migration time scale. That would be, we could do that. Uh, um, we could do that. I like surface density, I think for sort of obvious reasons, because I can relate it to things like this, right? To these other lines of evidence arguing for, which also use surface density, right? Which are also trying to get at surface density at the time that those sub-Neptunes appear. So I was going to relate, and I, I'm going to relate <laughs> these surface densities to the surface densities required to produce, um, to produce uh, the atmospheres of, of super-Earths, right? Super-Earths have atmospheres. Uh, the atmospheric mass is on the order of a percent, give or take an order of magnitude. And what sort of disk surface densities do you need, okay, to reproduce those atmospheres? We get, you know, very compatible, very low uh, surface densities. And this is work that was uh, part of Eve Lee's thesis, right, showing that these, these highly depleted disks are completely compatible with uh, accretion of the atmospheres onto these super Earths. In fact, if you put a super Earth into a full nebula, right, a full minimum mass nebula, it explodes. And you get a Jupiter, which is, which is not what these super Earths are. So, so yeah, I, I, we like surface density. I agree with you. That there are uncertainties in the torque theory, but uh, we wanted to connect it to other lines of evidence, namely this one. And, and this other one too, uh, which is that for cores to merge, right, uh, you need to have a low surface density for these protocores, like these, what they call oligarchs, these 15 sub-Earth uh, cores uh, to merge, you need to bring the surface density low, lower than about 10 to the minus two for their parameters. Uh, relative to the minimum mass value because otherwise there's too much dynamical friction and if there's too much dynamical friction then you circularize all the orbits and you never merge so you have to bring the sigma down before you get this orbit crossing and growth right into into super earths so i think the story hangs together uh at well, least for but, the last uh, last few doublings but uh eugene um did this uh, uh Kaminami and Ida calculation include the migration? Uh, oh, I don't recall. Um, it doesn't look like it. I mean, those are, well, that's, you know, a fairly extended period of time, and those are pretty flat curves before uh, things go haywire. Well, the question, the question though, is, is um, but again, they were dealing with low surface densities. Uh -huh. So they, they actually started at 10 to the minus two and they got down at this point when the orbits cross, mm -hmm. it's more like 10 to the minus three. Well, what, what we found, Russell and I, was that interestingly, this surface density, which may be related to ionization effects. So there may be a you know, buffering, a physical buffering effect. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh -huh. is a migration time, you know, a naive migration time. Uh, yes, there are the issues about the cancellation of the inner and outer torques and the correlation torques and so on, but a naive migration time for a several Earth mass planet aborted the lifetime of the protoplanetary disk. And uh, do you disagree with them? I mean, anyway, we, we got something, uh, we, we went through this. It's, it's, it's not too far off, um, which, which is interesting because it suggests that you could, you know, carry stuff in in fairly substantial chunks. Uh, from the outer disk, where in fact, after all, most of the raw material is 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 is, is initially sourced, and um, and not have it just quickly be swept one way or the other through the uh, inner planet formation zone. My guess is that uh, Komenami needed in this calculation that they did include the migration torque, mm -hmm. and it's just that you don't see it because the disks that they are considering are very low mass to begin with at their time zero. That's my guess. Okay. Um, the eccentricity damping time scales are always shorter, right? Than the um, uh, shorter by two, three orders of magnitude relative to the, to the semi-major axis damping.
timescales. So my guess is that they included it and you're just not seeing it because their disks are already low uh, in surface density. But this is getting, you know, you're bringing up valid points. It's true that the further back in time you go, the more important the migration will be. So, so uh, and I don't really know what happens in the distant past. I'm only trying to talk about the last doubling. Okay, okay, my aims are modest. All right, uh, there's some future, from some future work, uh, right? I've been talking, I've been giving data uh, results for the three to two. And it's a test, right? We, we sort of, it was a little scary for us, I, frankly. Like we, we fit for the three to two. And we said, okay, can we also reproduce the two to one without looking, sort of a blind test, okay? And uh, we don't, we're not gonna fit, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna keep the same disk model and see, okay, can we also get the two to one? Well, uh, partial success, we, we, we can get it. It looks okay, kind of. Uh, here's the here's the results the solid histogram okay for the two to one now here's the the blue histogram is the model that was not fitted for the two to one but fitted for the three to two and this is what we get eh, encouraging but it doesn't look very good at all at short period okay at short period the data look like this the solid histogram and then the model right looks like this so at short period something else is going on and it's, it's uh, my, our guess is tides, right? So tides, uh, in particular, obliquity tides. And there's this really interesting um, uh, proposal by Milholland and Laughlin talking about obliquity tides. In fact, Milholland recently has pointed out how the two to one, in particular, the two to one, not the three to two, but the two to one planets uh, are especially puffy. And that suggests extra dissipation from obliquity tides, perhaps. So that seems, that seems to fit. Um, this business about, you know, we need, here's another issue. We need uh, the planets to, to converge, okay, when they migrate to lock into resonance. Um, that, whether they converge or diverge depends upon the mass ratio. It's amazing what we know now. Uh, I mean, this really nice work by Haddon and Lithwick, transit timing variations, right? Uh, solving for the, the masses of these planets, the outer one is, is just as likely to be more massive uh, as uh, more massive than the inner one. And it, it's just as likely for the inner one to be more massive than the outer one. Okay, so you would, might expect 50-50 uh, to get a, a healthy fraction of convergent systems you really need something, uh, these, these surface density profiles that decrease on the way out, like minimum mass. Eight, here's another reason to hate the minimum mass. Eight of the minus three halves, I mean, that's terrible, right, for convergent migration. It, it moves the inner one faster. It's terrible. So you need something flatter, uh, if not actually increasing as you go out. My favorite idea at the moment is that uh, the more robust idea to, to guarantee convergence is if you carve out a, a deep enough common gap between the two planets, right? A given planet will carve out a gap, of course, and if you have two planets, then the material in between will be especially emptied out. And if that's the case, then there's no choice but for the migration to be convergent. So that I think is a, is a nice way to ensure convergent migration, uh, no matter what your background surface density profile is. Okay, uh, a lot of people have asked questions, which is great. Um, uh, but I also see that my time is up, which is fine. I'm happy to, to, to end it here. Uh, I did have just a few more slides, so I think four, on, on this other topic of uh, mass metallicity relations. But um, maybe, that can, maybe that can wait. Um, well, I think uh, if people who want to leave, they, may, they can leave now. Otherwise, uh, if, since you have only a few slides left, maybe we are very uh, interested in seeing your other work. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll condense it. I'll definitely, I won't show every slide. I'll show probably two. The, the, the idea is very simple. So I'll just show two out of the four. But yeah, people should go if they want. Um, show all four if you want. Sorry, what? <laughs> 
Show all four if you want. Show <laughs> all four. Okay. I, I, it's, too, it's too simple. It's not worth showing four. It's late. I have dishes to do. Uh, it's time to do the dishes again. God, I can't tell you how many dishes I've done at this point. <laughs> it's just it's always time to do the dishes. All right. Well, I'm just going to keep going. Um, so... Uh, Here's the data we'd like to explain. Uh, this is switching gears now to gas giants. Um, but there's a connection between this work and the previous work. And the connection is planet formation by major mergers. Okay, I like planet formation by major mergers, all this pebble accretion stuff. Actually, it's really interesting. But, uh, but uh, I don't think it's that relevant, at least for Kepler super Earths or, um, or gas giants. This talk is recorded. <laughs> no good. I'm good. No. Broadcasted. It's my communist okay. manifesto. Okay. So, so. It's now okay. digitally recorded, right? So, All right. So ma 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 major mergers and uh, what's the evidence for major mergers? It's really simple. Um, so the data we're trying to explain are is this mass metallicity relation, right? You you have a radius. You measure a radius, you measure a mass, and then you try to infer, oh, okay, how much mass is in heavy metals? So you can plot the heavy metal mass versus planet mass. So between a tenth of a Jupiter and 10 Jupiters, of course, the amount of heavy metals increases. But notice it's less than linear, right? It's sublinear, right? These lines are slope one, so it's less than linear. And an equivalent way of saying this is to plot the metallicity of the planet divided by the metallicity of the star. Um, and uh, first thing to note is that everybody is super solar, not su super stellar metallicity, right? Because here's the stellar metallicity line, one. And everybody is metal rich. But as you go to higher and higher planet masses, you get less metal rich. So you approach the stellar metallicity. So these are the data we're trying to explain. Um, the trend, right, I think is easy to explain. What's more interesting to explain for us is the scatter. Okay, the scatter. So the scatter uh, here is, right, look at one Jupiter. So one, here's Jupiter right here. And look at, look, look at all these things. They're all a Jupiter mass, but they have like 100, 200 Earth masses worth of metals. You know, a good fraction of that. Uh, could be in a core. I mean, how are you going to get a hundred earth mass core um, given that just 10 earth masses or 20 earth masses is sufficient to undergo runaway accretion to become a gas giant? So when Sivan and I looked at this, we were sort of reminded, like, it sort of reminded us, us of these LIGO black holes. Like, LIGO finds these black holes that are 60 solar masses. How are you going to get that from the explosion of a single star? Well, you don't is the idea. The idea is that you merge, right? black holes to increase their, their, their mass. And here, the same idea we're, tr we're going to try to use here to try to merge, uh, major merge, these proto-Jupiters to create these, what we call super heavy metals, uh, 100, Earth mass, 100 Earth mass cores. Okay, so that's one slide and I don't want it, so, right? This is, the, that's the idea, right? You have a set of proto-Jupiters um, and you're going to merge them. Of course, you merge them, but at the same time, you're accreting gas at the same time, right? So it's concurrent. We call it concurrent mergers plus gas accretion. This is happening at the same time. I'm not going to go through all these equations. I'm not going to do this either. What I am going to show you is the result that we have so far. We're still working on it. Um, and uh, the result is, okay, so here's the same data, right? Same data. Uh, Z planet over Z star versus planet mass. The data is the red points and the, the model, our model is the, the mean uh, relation is this black one right here. So that's how well we do there. And it's really simple. Um, it's just, just you're eating things at the same time that you're creating gas. Um, and uh, Again, what's more interesting is the, tre is the scatter. So how are we gonna get scatter, right, in this relation? And I think the scatter is produced, uh, in our model, is produced by the fact that these mergers are intrinsically chaotic, right? 
right? There's a whole distribution of merger times. Uh, there's orders of magnitude variation in what sets when uh, a planet will eat its, its neighbor or not. It's an n-body system where n could be like five or six. And, you know, it's super sensitive to separation and eccentricity. And the fact that mergers are discrete also, right? That nothing happens for a while, you create a lot of gas, and then boom, you swallow your neighbor. And so there's a discreteness to this whole merger process, which also introduces some scatter. And so accounting for the discreteness and the, and the, and the distribution, the chaotic distribution of merger times is what gives, gives rise to, to, to this scatter. We do need, I will say, we do need core masses that are about 30 Earth masses. To get this upper envelope, right, we needed a core mass. We need to start with a core mass that was 30 Earth masses. And then it underwent um, two doublings. It went from 30, swallowed its neighbor, 60, and then swallowed its other neighbor and became 120. And in this way, uh, we could get the upper envelope. Okay, so that's, that's all I wanted to show you, show here. Um, it's, a, it's a, again, a story of major mergers, just like the oligarchs for the sub-Neptunes, right? Same Komanami picture, but applied to uh, proto-Jupiters instead. So, so major mergers. All right. If, uh, thanks, uh, Eugene, for the very interesting talk. So maybe we can open up for more questions, if there are any. Well, uh, I have a question. Uh, yeah, go ahead. So I'm wondering if it makes any difference at all whether the planets are differentiated before they collide. Like, would you get it, would you get a difference or whether they're they're differentiated or not? Um. Yes, but I think at the order unity level, um, we did look at this a little bit, but only in the, in the, in the crudest of senses. I mean, the, uh, you know, in a collision, there is loss, right? There's also loss of the atmosphere, right? I mean, you're basically colliding with an energy. Your collision energy is of order, your binding energy, of course, right? It, it always has to be that. Um, because you're falling down each other as well. So, so there could be order unity loss in the mass uh, every time you, you collide. So I think that'll, that, I mean, that's yet another source of scatter, uh, I would say, for the metallicity. And you, you're referring specifically to differentiation. Sure, if you collide, if it's fully differentiated where all the solids have sank, then you only lose, you know, the, the low metallicity atmosphere. Whereas if it's still fully mixed, then you'll lose more of the solids. Uh, my guess is that that's, these are order unity effects because you use order unity of the mass. Um, it's an additional source of scatter. Yeah. Um, Eugene, so this, yeah. this, uh, as the planet is growing mass, your metallicity is dropping down the slope of this relationship. Uh, you said it's easy to explain. Is it uh, easy to see? Is it Relative scaling uh, so, between mergers uh, and accretion? Yeah, um, it is. And that's, uh, um, I still don't have a great, well, anyway, I, this is what we have so far. Uh, uh, yeah, okay, so the mean. The mean is um, when you have, when you have um, it's, it's all here to answer your question. And uh, the, this mean relation is set by mergers happening at the same time that gas is accreting. Okay, that's concurrent mergers plus gas accretion. The gas accretion happens on some cooling time scale for the atmosphere, right? This is post runaway. This is runaway. So the cooling time goes as one over m squared. It's a runaway process. So you set this cooling time, which is the gas accretion time scale, equal, oh, equal to the merger time scale, 
which is set by the crossing time scale, right? And, which is this crazy, um, as you know, uh, uh, super steep power of the, of the um, separation, right? K, K is, the, is the separation measured in mutual Hill radii. So, so this scales as the separation over the mass to the one third power, to some crazy power like 15. You set these two equal to one another for, because you say that mergers and gas accretion are happening at the same time over the same time scale. The mass doubling time scale is, is, is set by both. So when you set these two equal to one another, you find that the separation, right, scales as you do the math, m to the one fifth. The separation, right, this tells you how the separation increases as the mass of the planets is increasing in the mean. But the separation tells you actually exactly what the core mass is doing, right? Because the separation and the core mass are one to one. If you double, if you double the separation that you made, that means you ate exactly one other planet, which means you, you, have, you, you have doubled the mass of your core. So M core has, is in direct proportion to delta, to delta A. And in that case, Right, if delta A goes as m to the one fifth, then m core goes as m to the one fifth. And this is the only thing you need. This is it, you're done. This is the only thing you need. You need some relation between m core and m to the one fifth, and, and m, some relation, and you plug this relation into this to find the, the mass metallicity relation, right? Because once you know m core, uh, once you know m core, for a given M, then M gas is just, you know, M minus M core. So, so that's it. And that's, you know, that gives you this line. Uh, that gives you this, that gives you this line. So, I, 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 but I do wanna say, um, as, as simple as it is, my guess is that, my feeling is that, like other theories <laughs> would give you the same thing too, would give you something similar. Um, but then, so the slope yeah. is the relationship you were just showing. Yeah, and normalization, yeah. however, depends right. on, just that's dependence on, like we right. said, core that's mass, right. individual core mass. Exactly, uh -huh. that, exactly, exactly. So mm -hmm. that, the normal, exactly. So the normalization, this mm -hmm. line assumes yeah. an M core, that the whole thing starts at 10 Earth masses. And then we go, we grow from there. So, and I like 10 earth masses because that's what people talk about for runaway accretion. However, to get the upper envelope, I need to increase that to 30. I, I mean, if I just use 10 and I accounted for the, the scatter from, from chaos and from discreteness, then I get these lines. Okay. And that there's some scatter there, but not enough to get all the points. So that's why I need to, I'm forced to, uh, to, to, to be perfectly honest, uh, I'm, I feel a little bit uncomfortable about it. Um, I have to appeal to higher core masses, uh, 30 earth masses, then I can get up to 100. There's one effect I, I, I neglected to mention, and since you, since you asked the question, one thing I, we, we still need to do is uh, fold in the effects of Pu and Wu. Because you had pointed out that, oh, you know, when the masses are unequal, then the, then the uh, merger times are different. And we're using relations, uh, you might have recognized, from Zoo, where all the masses are assumed to be the same, right? And they have these nice power laws uh, where all the masses are the same. But in real life, the masses will be different. And the next step is to try to fold that in to see how it changes our answer. Yeah. So Eugene, these are hot Jupiters? No, so good question. Um, these are no, because uh, when Thorngren and Fortney made this plot, they deliberately screened out the hot Jupiters, okay. right? Because, you, you know, there's some, you know, weird physics that I don't there's, know if they're, anybody... They're warm Jupiters then. Yeah, they're warm, if not but, cold. But yeah, then they're warm, if not cold. Migration yeah. is a serious possibility. Sorry, what? Migration then is a serious possibility for. Oh them. yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, but, in, but in that case, you may not just be interacting with your initial neighbors. You could be, you know, sweeping up a, 
a range of stuff, could it? True, true, true enough. True enough. Um, I will say that for the parameters we're using, um, I mean, I, I don't really want to, this is such a busy plot. I'll just say it. Um, for the parameters we're using, uh, the, the gas accretion time scale, which is the merger time scale, for the parameters we're using, they're very short, uh, 10 to the four years, and then lower, actually. So, so, um, so all of this merger stuff happens really quick. And then uh, the migration can happen on a longer time scale. So, so yes, we, you know, it can happen, uh, yeah, after, after this initial frenzy of, of mergers. And the reason why our merger timescales and our gas accretion timescales, which are the same, is so short, we chose, we chose a value of 10 to the four years to start the whole show, mergers plus gas, and then it only gets shorter from there, is because we were imagining um, a, a low opacity, quote unquote, dust-free uh, opacity. Um, as, you, as you may know, right, the uh, runaway accretion depends very sensitively on the opacity of the gas and we choose a low opacity, uh, a low kappa, to get the cooling rates short. So, so we accrete a lot of gas really quick on time scales of 10 to the four years. And on time scales of 10 to the four years, the migration, I think, is, is, uh, is negligible. It's especially negligible once you account for the gap, right? And these, these things will also be for carving out gaps. And so uh, that'll also lengthen the migration time scale. If you look back in the history of the course, uh, did they uh, arise because of uh, pebble accretion? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe. I don't know what happens, you know, past okay. the yeah, you maybe. get in, it seems yeah. like you, you get into this stage where all of a sudden it runs away. These are very short time scales. Yeah. yeah. Um, early on, uh, it could be minor mergers. It could be pebble accretion. Um, you know, that the early on business is tied to the whole problem of planetesimal formation, yeah. which I've always had a horrible time understanding all this streaming instability stuff. I mean, it looks really promising, but I, I still don't quite know how it all fits together. Um, but yeah, pebble accretion is a possibility earlier on, just not for the last few doublings. So Eugene, I have a question about this. Uh major merger scenario. So you showed in your last plot that in order to get to the upper envelope, yeah. you know, basically uh, start with very massive cores and the uh, two doublings in order to yeah. get up to yeah. 100. Does that mean that all those uh, uh, planets with uh, massive, uh, with lots of metals, they don't have close neighbors or any neighbors at all? No, we, we, yeah, uh, I mean, um, you'd expect some neighbors, right? Well, I'm not sure what to expect. Um, uh, after all the mergers are, hap are over, the question is how many neighbors do you have left, mm. uh, right? And I'm not sure what we can say about it. I, I have had conversations with Sivan about this, and, but neither of us can come to any robust conclusion. Um, when the mergers, when it's all over, how many neighbors do you have left? Um, I will say this, uh, all, this merger scenario that we're computing, it all works at about a few AU, which is what I said at the beginning is where you find most of the, most Jupiters in general, right? Um, a lot of these systems are not at a few AU, right? Only some of them are. 
So a lot of them are like, I don't know, point, point 0.2, point 0.3 AU. They're not at like three AU. So you have to invoke migration, right? Well, we have to anyway, um, to explain their current positions. I think that migration can happen later after the frenzy that happens at, at a few AU initially. Now, after your, your question is about neighbors. Well, if we're going to invoke, as I am now invoking, a period of migration to create these, right? After you form this, the heavy metal, then you move it in, right? Over a longer time scale. When you move it in, uh, if there were any neighbors, maybe you ate them, you know? So, um, yeah, is, is part of the question, if you look at the data, are there any pairs that are from the same extrasolar system? Uh, plot, or are they, right. Or, or there's just one per, uh, there's just, there's just one. There's just, there's just all of these. I checked. They're all, they're all one. Oh, okay. um, they're all, they're all individuals. They're, they're not paired up. Um, um, well, you, you know, you and, that, can, and that I think that I think out a request for uh, some information on pairs because it would really uh, be interesting for the theories, wouldn't it? If you could find two in one system, this yeah, 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 yeah. Um, it's a good question. I really haven't thought about it. Um, we did get we did get this far though. You know, if you set up this system of say 10 earth mass cores like a whole string of them you don't expect all of them to be doing the same thing right mm -hmm. uh, at the same time runaway there's a there's a reason we call it runaway i mean it's it's really fast yeah. once it gets going it's it's really fast and so um you expect the first one to go runaway to sort of control the show right and so you expect the first one to go runaway oh to start like gobbling up it's it's it's, uh, its nearest neighbors. Yeah. Another question is, is about the, the final spin or the obliquity of the planet. Mm. Since you have all these mergers and assume it's very chaotic, then it may probably uh, change the obliquity significantly and presumably maybe the shape as well. Uh, good, good point. Um, people, you know that people have been, uh, Marta Bryan has been uh, doing really interesting observations of obliquities. Unfortunately, not of these, right? These, I think, are hopeless, yes. right? These are, these, these are hopeless because they're too close. But the ones that she's been targeting are the ones that are far out, mm -hmm. like at 30, 50, 100 AU. A lot of brown dwarfs, too. And we just, we just, uh, uh, well, she led this project uh, where she found some evidence, you know, for a large obliquity at, but that was at large distance. And at, it's really a different story, I think, at large distance, because you can't invoke collisions for a large distance, right? Because if you have an encounter, large distances, the encounter doesn't result in a collision. The encounter results in ejection. Right. Yeah. So, so, I mean, this is something I'm working on to try to explain the large obliquities for the really, for where it's measured, which is the distant, the really distant gas giants. Um, but you're right for these, uh, for these close in ones. Yeah. Uh, I suppose they, they could have large obliquities. Um, how would you, I don't know, how would you, uh, how would you test that though? Yeah. Well, you, can, you, can, you can try to see the very small signal in the transit light curve through the, the obliqueness of the plan, if there is significant. I see, yeah, if there's significant, if it's close to breakup or something, yeah. Right. You can, you know, rotational obliqueness. Right. Yeah. That seems pretty ambitious, but yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's good. I like, I like that. Uh, I like that. A lot of these are transiting. They're like WASP systems, right? So 
Yeah, I think they, they, yeah. they must transit. You know, otherwise, you won't have the mass radius. You know, exactly. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So good point. No, that's a nice test. Uh, yeah. Uh, can you get, uh, it'd be interesting to know what, what limits you can place on oblis uh, what sensitivity you have to oblateness. Right. Well, mm -hmm. actually that's something uh, uh, we've been working on with another uh, with a student. So I, we can chat more about this uh, maybe tomorrow. Great, great. No, that's nice. Mm -hmm. I like that. All right, is there other questions for Eugene? No, I think it's already past uh, 12 at the West Coast. So maybe we should uh, let uh, Eugene go and uh, then talk to him later individually. Yeah, Great. Thank, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Eugene. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Eugene and I will be on the same, we'll be using the same Zoom link. Uh, 